So if, you, if you're locked inside a building that's on fire, you have a right to break windows to get out. The problems, of course, arise when you try to decide what windows to break and how. We staan in het Bloesempark. We zijn aan het voorverzamelen en een beetje aan het voorbereiden voor een actie die we straks gaan doen. Voor het klimaat en tegen de grote vervuiler Schiphol. Ik heb geen idee wat we gaan doen. Het is een uh, geheime actie. En als mensen dat al weten van tevoren en dat dan bij de politie terechtkomt of bij Schiphol, uh, dan gaat de actie niet door. Um, dus het is eigenlijk dat we het niet weten zodat we het kunnen doen. Dus eigenlijk heb ik geen idee wat ik kan verwachten en vind ik het best wel spannend. Ondanks dat ik bang ben, ben ik eigenlijk banger voor klimaatontwrichting. En ben ik ook boos dat Schiphol door kan gaan met wat het doet. Daarom denk ik dat het soms nodig is om dingen te doen die je eng vindt of oncomfortabel vindt. Om tegen te gaan dat er nog engere, nog oncomfortabelere dingen gebeuren. Please for! Please for! We staan nu uh, klaar om de wandeling te starten en uh, ik denk dat we ieder moment kunnen gaan lopen. We are unstoppable and not a world is possible. We are unstoppable and not a world is possible. Wat doen we voor? Climate justice. Wat doen we voor dit? Now. And not a world is possible. We are unstoppable and not a world is possible. Er zijn net, uh, is het mensen gelukt om binnen te geraken op uh, dit uh, privé vliegveld landingsbaangeval. Hier was een hek dat was dicht. Dat is op een bepaalde manier open gegaan. Uh, en toen waren er uh, mensen naar binnen gegaan. En die hebben ondertussen uh, de, vliegvelden, ja, de vliegtuigen bereikt. Dat zijn privéjets. Nou, privéjets zijn de meest belachelijke voertuigen om nu nog te gebruiken. En uh, nou, daarom ben ik super blij dat er mensen. Ja, hun lichaam en hun tijd in de strijd zetten om dit tegen te houden. Um, ik sta nog hier. Mij is dat uh, niet gelukt om daar doorheen te raken. Ik werd net uh, even vastgehouden tegen het hek. Maar uh, ik ben super blij dat het mensen gelukt is om uh, op het terrein te komen. En ook ja, de aandacht vestigen op dat dit gebeurt. Dus uh, ja, ik ben tevreden. Ik denk dat het climate movement is de source of hope that we have in this world right now. Uh, you know, the trends are all pointing in the wrong directions with more emissions, with uh, astronomic profits for the oil and gas companies, pouring them back into further expansion of fossil fuel installations. And in this very bleak moment, it's the climate movement and the activists that make, uh, make it up that, you know, represent some kind of reason and uh, connection to reality. And uh, they insist on um, an end to business as usual. And uh, clearly, we can't rely on states and governments to end business as usual. They're just perpetuating it. So we, ordinary people, have to do it. I think that we should focus on trying to stop new fossil fuel installations uh, because that's what we just cannot take anymore. And we should focus on that by trying to inflict material and financial cost on the companies engaged in those projects. And that can range from sabotaging new pipelines or gas terminals or coal mines to going after the company headquarters and the companies behind these uh, projects. Just one case. Total, the single largest private company based in France right now, is building the East Africa crude oil pipeline, which will be the world's single longest heated pipeline, causing a mind-boggling amount of CO2 emissions. There should be a movement targeting that pipeline project and the company behind it, and make sure that that pipeline is never built, and that the oil it's supposed to convey is left in the ground, and uh, in the last instance that this company Total uh, is turned into something else than an oil and gas company, because we can't have oil and gas companies anymore. That, that has to come to an end, that very phenomenon. I also think that we um, have uh, reason to focus on luxury emissions, so these extreme emissions that are caused by the ultra-rich, and we should remember that uh, uh, the richest 1% of humanity has emitted 
more than twice as much CO2 as the poorest half of humanity over the past three decades. That's, to me, a dizzying number. And the ultra-rich keep expanding their share of total emissions by having this kind of profligate lifestyle where they uh, drive around in multiple SUVs and private jets and super yachts. And these objects are ripe for disruption, I think. It's up to the climate movement to make sure that there are principles and rules and limits for how to go about these things. I don't think that's impossible. We have a lot of cases in history where political formations set up principles for themselves. This is what we're going to do, but we're not going to do that thing. And there's no necessity in a kind of spiral or vendetta or, you know, runaway process of ending up with with uh, uh, unlimited violence, uh, I think. The, well, there is full agreement and consensus in the climate movement that we should not engage in any kind of violence against people. That's totally out of the question. No one is uh, even considering that. But, um, yeah, so there, I mean, there is this philosophical debate about how do you define violence? If I destroy a machine, does that count as violence or not? I think the important thing to remember is that when it comes to the climate crisis, the violence that is being perpetrated is in the production and combustion of fossil fuels because these acts actually kill people. We know that. Thousands of people have been killed over the past months in countries such as Pakistan or Nigeria from floods. And they die because of the CO2 that has been emitted based on fossil fuel production primarily in rich countries of the past two centuries. Uh, and that's something that we should always stress, that climate change kills, and uh, we are opposing that violence. Every movement that challenges vested interests will face backlash. And that was the case with the climate movement back in 2019, and it's the case now. And it will be the case in the future. And uh, uh, this is, of course, one reason why we need to be very careful and intelligent about selecting the appropriate targets for our action and make sure that what we do can be explained and, and uh, make sense to people. So uh, this is in f distinction from, for instance, these uh, sabotage actions against the Nord Stream pipelines that are very unclear. We don't know who did it and why. It has some kind of relation to the war in Ukraine, it appears, but it's completely opaque and it's not part of any climate struggle and it causes great environmental damage with the methane leakage. So it's the perfect case, example of what sabotage shouldn't look like. Disruptive tactics are by definition illegal. I mean, civil disobedience isn't legal either. You don't have a legal right to go and shut down a square as the Extinction Rebellion did in 2019. So I don't see any problem by definition of breaking the law. I mean, that's... Uh, there is... I don't know of any moral philosopher who says that you always have to abide by the law. Where would that lead you? I mean, there are always laws that are unjust and unfair. And uh, there, is, there is no democratic principle that says that you have to always abide by the laws, even in a society that has representative democracy. The question is, when is it right to, to break a law and what law uh, are you entitled to break? And some actions in this regard might be less successful than others. So, for instance, I'm not sure that continuously throwing stuff on paintings is a very good idea because that makes it look like we have a, you know, a, a systematic campaign against art, which is completely nonsensical. I think this is a process of trial and error where we'll need to learn what works and what doesn't work and uh, obviously revise our tactics as we go along and concentrate on, on what's most uh, effective. Who